Welcome to our educational session on osteoporosis. You have been invited to this group meeting because your recent bone density study demonstrated an increased risk for fracture. We hope by hosting this opportunity for learning that you will better understand what osteoporosis is, what the risks are, and what the benefits and risks are for the many options for treatment. Osteoporosis is defined as a skeletal disorder characterized by the loss of bone strength resulting in an increased risk of fracture. The determinations of bone strength include bone density and bone quality. A bone density study only assesses bone density. We cannot easily measure bone quality without bone biopsy or other research techniques. As you can see on the slide, the top picture demonstrates normal bone uh, and the lower picture demonstrates loss of connective cross pieces and thinning of the internal structure of the bone, putting it at increased risk of fracture. This cartoon shows the progression of loss of height and collapse of vertebrae in severe osteoporosis. Uh, you can see age 40, age 60, and age 70. This is the progression that we are trying to prevent with our therapies. The curve on this slide depicts the change in bone mineral density in females aged 10 to 80 years. Uh, in menopause women aged 50 to 60 years of age, the slope of bone mineral density loss is accelerated uh, much more than other ages and in other groups. This explains why menopausal women are particularly susceptible to osteoporosis and the osteoporosis-related fractures. Note that peak bone mass occurs at about age 30. This cartoon is going to show you what happens in normal and then in bone loss. Bones are continually remodeling to keep them strong. This starts with bone resorption by cells called osteoclasts. This is the osteoclast eating out a cavity in bone, which is the normal part of bone recycling. Once a cavity is created, bone forming cells called osteoblasts follow and form new bone to fill in the cavity. Pink cell is the osteoblast, and there are the blue cells which proliferate and fill in this space. Once menopause occurs, or 10 years later in men, the bone forming process does not keep up with the bone resorption process, resulting in net loss of bone. The boxes above the bone cartoon uh, are some of the factors that go into controlling bone formation and represent options for treatment. These bar graphs show the approximate risk of fractures compared to fairly, fairly commonly known other medical conditions. Notice that for women, fracture risk is four times higher than the risk of breast cancer, and for men, fracture risk is still higher than prostate cancer. So this is a very common occurrence in patients as they age, both male and female, but obviously more notable for women. This figure shows the frequency of fractures as patients age. Uh, spine fractures occur much more frequently and occur much earlier than hip or wrist fractures, but all these increase as the patient ages. The cartoon here suggests that uh, lifestyle changes are important for maintaining uh, your bone density. Uh, these include adequate calcium intake, normal vitamin D levels, and exercise. These are all important in delaying bone loss, but in general will not rebuild bone once bone loss has occurred. Cartoon here. Uh, I keep finding these all over the house. The man is holding uh, bones, and the woman says, 
My doctor says bone loss is normal at any age. As I have shown you on a previous slide, bone loss after age 30 is inevitable. The goal of therapies, either lifestyle or pharmacologic, is to reduce the rate of bone loss, or once bone loss has occurred, to increase bone density to reduce the risk of fracture. So in the United States, uh, roughly 10 million Americans have osteoporosis. The risk of fracture is about 25% in women and men a little bit less once they uh, uh, get over the age of 50. Half of all women over the age of 50 and 25% of all men will have an osteoporotic fracture. So this is an extremely common occurrence and one we would like to prevent. Flow sheet here uh, explain the various pathways that can lead to fracture. Some are treatable and some are not. You can't change your age. Uh, you can't change the fact that you may have passed menopause. Uh, for some men, hypogonism can be treated, but others cannot be because of other medical conditions. Uh, other risk factors can be affected, uh, such as smoking, alcohol intake, exercise, certain types of medications, and improving calcium and vitamin D intake, and by avoiding risky behaviors like skydiving, bungee jumping, for example. So how do we identify the patients who are at risk? Uh, we start first by determining whether or not you have suffered a previous osteoporotic fracture. This defines osteoporosis even before any kind of x-ray studies are done. These would include any fracture from a standing height of spine, hip, wrist, pelvis, shoulder, or perhaps ribs. It does not include fingers or toes. A bone density study called the DEXA scan is the gold standard for assessing bone status. This is our best predictor of risk of fracture. It is your bone density result that has prompted your invitation to this educational session. Bone density results are measured as T-score or Z-score. T-score compares bone density to peak value at around age 30. Z-score compares bone density to age-matched patients. Fracture risk is determined by T-score. We only use Z-score for patients who are premenopausal. Uh, this slide shows the categories of the results of a bone density study. There are only three, normal, low bone mass or osteopenia, and osteoporosis. If you've had a fracture and have a bone density considered in the osteoporosis category, then this is called severe osteoporosis. There is no such thing as mild or moderate or severe osteopenia. This is similar to being mildly pregnant. However, within the low bone mass category, we can estimate risk. If we didn't do that, we'd be treating patients who are at fairly low risk. Once we have learned that osteoporosis medications have some risk, it became necessary to decide who was at higher risk so we can treat those patients who would benefit. And therefore, the FRAX score was created. The FRAX score is a fracture risk identification tool and it includes these factors in its calculation. Age being the most important, low body mass index or being very thin, a family history of a hip fracture, currently smoking alcohol intake of more than three units per day, a history of rheumatoid arthritis or other secondary causes of osteoporosis, uh, taking steroids, or having had a previous fracture. This is an example of how the FRAX score is calculated. So we put in your weight, we put in your height, and then we get uh, these numbers that fill into weight and height into kilograms and centimeters, put in age, uh, fill out these risk factors as shown on the previous slide, and then enter in the bone density from your uh, bone density score. And this computes a risk factor over here. For this example on this slide, major osteoporotic fracture is listed as 29 and hip fracture at 3.7. Treatment thresholds are a hip fracture risk of greater than 3% at 10 years or a major osteoporotic fracture at greater than 20% at 10 years. 
If you have a number that exceeds these numbers, then the recommendation is to be treated with a pharmacologic therapy beyond just calcium and vitamin D. So what are our goals as a clinician? Number one, identify patients at risk. That's why we do the bone densities. Number two, reduce the risk of fracture. And number three, maintain quality of life. Uh, in the villages, I, this might be playing pickleball or shuffleboard, or in my case, tennis and softball. So we have universal recommendations for lifestyle benefits uh, as highlighted above. Uh, number one, you're at this session because we want to counsel you on the risk for fractures. These include being safe and, and preventing falls, number one, uh, eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, achieving calcium intake for men of 1,000 milligrams a day, for women 1,200 milligrams a day, and for men over 70, 1,200 milligrams a day. This can be achieved through dietary supplements or just through diet alone. So we have to sort of look at your diet, see whether or not you need excessive supplements in terms of pill form, or whether or not you can manage this with just diet. Vitamin D intake should be between 800 and 1,000 units per day. Uh, that's as a baseline, but in every situation, you should have your vitamin D level measured and make sure that you're getting it level it's in the normal range. We also recommend regular weight-bearing and muscle strengthening exercise, uh, and obviously fall prevention. If I can go back one point here, uh, there are many groups in the villages called bone builders. Bone builders are very good for exercise, for weight bearing and muscle strengthening, but they really do not increase your bone density dramatically. So who gets treated? Well, number one, if you've had a fracture, uh, or if your bone density by DEXA is less than minus 2.5, this defines osteoporosis. And number two, patients with low bone mass or osteopenia who have that high FRAC score that I pointed out before, greater than 3% risk of hip fracture at 10 years, or greater than 20% of any fracture within 10 years for a major osteoporotic fracture. So if you remember back from our cartoon about the bone remodeling cycle, we can look at how bones are metabolized and how we can fantasize as how we can affect bone loss. The figure here is complex, and I don't want to point out everything on the slide, but we'll point out some of the key features. On the right is the osteoclast. This is the cell which breaks down bone. We can inhibit bone breakdown with drugs called bisphosphonates. That's this word right here. Bisphosphonates include alendronate or Fosamax, Residronate or Actinel, Abandronate or Boniva, or Zoledronic Acid or Reclast. They are all in the same class of drug. Uh, these agents inhibit osteoclastic activity and slow down bone resorption. You can also use an anti-rank L antibody. This is Prolia or Denosumab, which works in a different pathway, but it still affects osteoclastic activity. All these improve bone density by slowing bone breakdown. You can also stimulate osteoblasts uh, over here uh, and do this through agents which make osteoblast activity increase and therefore increase bone formation. These include Forteo or Timlos. Not shown on this slide is a brand new agent called Divinity, which works through a different pathway. And this is a table, uh, an overview of this based on evidence of various strength of pharmacologic therapies. As you can see, the first three drugs, calcitonin, raloxifene, and abandronate, reduce the risk of vertebral fracture, but not of non-vertebral fracture and not of hip fracture. For this reason, we do not recommend these therapies as primary therapies. The agents in light blue uh, are all uh, effective in reducing vertebral fracture, non-vertebral fracture, and hip fracture. All of these are agents that work by blocking resorption. Three of these are bisphosphonates, alendronate, residronate, zoledronic acid, and denosumab is the anti-rank ligand antibody, uh, also called prolia. The final three drugs, teriparatide, which is Forteo, Timlos, and Avenity, all reduce vertebral fracture and non-vertebral fracture, but did not achieve significance in lowering hip fracture, although all experts believe that the trials had been big enough that these would have been successful in reducing the risk of hip fracture. 
There's an enormous amount of data on the benefits of osteoporosis therapy. Far too much to bore you with, but I just wanted to give you a flavor so that you can make an informed decision about treatment. The graph above shows the reduction in clinical vertebral fracture on reclass versus the control group who took calcium and vitamin D. You can see at three years, there is a 77% reduction in the occurrence of clinical vertebral fractures. The fracture protection from reclass and the results for oral bisphosphonates, alendronate and residronate, are fairly similar. And they exceed the benefits seen for any other treatment that you might imagine, like statins for cholesterol, blood pressure, medicines for high blood pressure, or diabetes control. We reduce the risk of complications from osteoporosis almost to double the extent that we can achieve with these other classes of medications for different issues. Uh, this slide looks at the reduction of hip fracture for reclass as well. You can see here the reduction is 40%, uh, but compared to the placebo group, which again was calcium and vitamin D. Um, and hip fracture is more debilitating than vertebral fractures for patients with a higher result of disability and even death, particularly in men. This slide shows the data for prolia or denosumab. And you can see results are very similar. At 36 months, there's a 68% reduction in vertebral fractures, but this reduction is also seen as early as one year. So you get this effect within one year, you don't have to wait three years before you see a clinical benefit. Uh, this slide shows the reduction for denosumab or prolia on hip fractures. And again, you can see a 40% reduction in hip fractures at the end of this study. So that's very similar to the results that we saw for a reclass. So we know that these class of agents are very effective in reducing the risk of fracture. Um, so what are any risks attached to, attached to taking these medic medications? Oral forma formulation can cause esophageal irritation. Uh, these are oral medications. These can lead to frequent discontinuation. This is alendronate and residronate. Now, the studies have shown that at six months, 50% of patients have stopped taking these medications for some perceived or real side effect. If you take less than 30%, less than 70% of these medications, they are ineffective. So if they're not tolerated orally, uh, then there will be no benefit for taking these things. Um, IV zoledronic acid uh, can cause an acute phase response uh, and this means achiness, low-grade fever for several days after taking these intravenous treatments. This occurs in only in about 5% of patients and decreases with repeat treatment, but it's enough reason that some patients will not want to have a second treatment. Uh, these medications cannot be given uh, if the patients have low calcium, and so anytime you get treated with either of these agents, you must have a baseline calcium and vitamin D level to make sure these medications are safe to give. These medications, zoledronic acid, residronate, alendronate, are restricted if you have impaired kidney function, so it cannot be used under those circumstances. Prolia can be used with reduced kidney function. Uh, rare patients get musculoskeletal pain, but now we're going to talk about the ones that are of most concern, which is osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical femoral fractures. So what is and what isn't osteonecrosis? Osteonecrosis is defined as exposed bone in the maxillofacial region, which is basically upper or lower jaw, with no healing at eight weeks. It only occurs after dental surgery. It does not occur, occur after cleaning or filling. As you can see, the risk is between one in 10,000 and one in 100,000 patient years. I have never had this occur in all the years of my practice. Dentists will warn you about the danger of this, but the risk is way overstated. After all, they're seeing all the patients who have this problem, but they're not seeing all the patients who don't have this problem. This only occurs in patients on bisphosphonates or prolia, but again, very rarely. If you're being treated for cancer with Exgeva, which is prolia given at a bigger dose, or zoledronic acid given monthly, then the risk is much higher, perhaps as high as 3%. Uh, but in osteoporosis, again, this is very, very uncommon. No cases seen in 60,000 patient years of clinical trials. Osteonecrosis is not jaw pain. It is not TMJ. 
It is not symptomatic unless you have an actual ulcer in the mouth. Uh, and it never occurs in patients who take Timlos or Forteo. So these drugs do not even have that risk as a possibility. Uh, this slide is kind of hard to read, so let me point out the important parts of this. Uh, I want you to look at the vertebral fracture line. One way to look at benefits and risk is to look at the number needed to treat. Uh, so in this study, uh, the number of patients needed to be treated to prevent one vertebral fracture is 14 patients. So it's very effective therapy uh, based on our general way of calculating these things. If you look at the 1.5 line, the number needed to treat to cause one atypical femoral fracture is 2,899. So compare 14 to 2,899, and the risk-benefit ratio is very, very much in favor of the benefits of treatment. An atypical femoral fracture is a mid-shaft femur fracture, not the typical hip fracture that people get, uh, and typically presents with aching long before the fracture occurs. Because of these observations, it is recommended that therapy, therapies be stopped or changed at five years for a drug holiday to avoid this kind of problem. I have seen atypical fractures a few times and only in patients who were treated for more than 10 years with the same therapy. This means that if you only take therapy for five years and you're going to live more than five years, you're likely to be on more than one kind of therapy in the course of your treatment. Now let's Go briefly over the bone forming agents. This is teriparatide or Forteo. And this looks at the risk of new vertebral fractures and the course of their trial, which was 18 months. And you can see again uh, the same 65 to 70 percent reduction in vertebral fractures, similar to the numbers shown for Reclast or for oral bisphosphonates or for the Nusimab. This is given as a daily injection for up to two years, so it's a little bit different in terms of how it's given. Uh, and because of that, it is generally reserved for patients who've had a previous fracture or have failed other therapies. Uh, this slide looks at Timlos or abiloparatide and compares it non-vertebral fractures between abiloparatide. Colors don't actually work here, so I apologize for that. The placebo line is blue. The midline, which is green, is teriparatide. And the bottom line, which should have been orange, is actually the Timlos line. But you can see that Timlo seems to be a bit better than Forte when preventing non-vertebral fractures, but both successful compared to placebo. Once again, Timlo is reserved for patients who have failed ordinary therapy or have a prior fracture. The last agent to just mention is Venity. Uh, this is the newest agent and works through a different pathway. It is given monthly as an injection in the office uh, and is, again, reserved for patients who have severe osteoporosis or a prior fracture or a failed therapy, but you can see that there's a 73% reduction in vertebral fracture at one year. So again, very successful therapy in reducing the risk of vertebral fracture. Now, over the, once you're on therapy, how do you know that it is working? Blood tests are not really very helpful. You really need to look at the change in bone density. Oral agents will demonstrate an increase in bone density more than 70% of the time if the patient is truly compliant. If the patient misses more than 30% of doses given once a week or once a month, then these medicines are ineffective. Agents given by injection or infusion are effective more than 90% of the time, again assuming compliance with an injection or infusion schedule. Crowley is given every six months, Silvadronic acid once a year, Avenity once a month, and Timlos and Forteo daily. Those are given, obviously, by the patient themselves. A fracture on therapy does not mean complete failure. After all, 30% of fractures are not prevented in the spine and 60% are not prevented in the hip. But if bone density is not improved or worsened on adequate therapy, then it is time to consider a change or at least a reassessment for other causes of bone loss. We recommend that you make an appointment with your primary care provider or one of the endocrinology rheumatology group to discuss your personal options for treatment. Thank you for your attention. You may now ask questions of the moderator.